This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. You know, we're continuing on with our Follies retrospective. It seems like the second Folly song, and just to let you know, there will be another Folly song in this Sondheim revisited mini season that we're going through. We have a great guest. Jesse McAnally is here to give his thoughts and feelings on Could I Leave You and on Phyllis more generally. And it's a really fun chat. That being said, there was an email I received that I just wanted to kind of touch upon. This came in from Patrick in in regards to the I'm Still Here episode that we just did here. And he wrote in, just FYI, I think you guys might be missing the intended meaning of the line, gone to an acting school. It's not about Carlotta's talent as an actress and succeeding in her career despite her lack of formal training. It's about her putting on a show for the anti-communist witch hunt hearings. And in fact, he does link to this Playbill interview with Elaine Page, who I'm going to quote directly from this interview where she is talking to Stephen Sondheim about that very lyric, gone to an acting school. And she says... Does she think she's a bad actress to make that comment? And he said, no, 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 it's not a new thought. It's connected to what you just said about been called a pinko commie tool, got through it stinko by my pool. Stephen said that that line relates to the McCarthy trials. He said he wrote the song about Joan Crawford, which I didn't know. And he said that she was an actress both on and off the stage and came to the McCarthy trials. She was holed up with a lot of other people. And he said that she was such a good actress that it left enough room for the fact that she might have been innocent. So someone said, she's sincere. So she responds, so I'm here. And now I come to be here. It's interesting. I don't think anybody would know that unless you got it from the horse's mouth. I think anybody listening to the song would not know that. You would automatically, I think, think that it was a new thought. But according to the author composer himself, that's not the case. So I feel somewhat justified. That doesn't mean that you who are listening to this have to agree with her. But it always has struck me that she was having two separate thoughts there. She was talking about being you know, accused of being a commie. And she got through that by being drunk beside her pool. And also, she should have gone to an acting school because she wasn't maybe very good or didn't believe in her own talents. But instead, it is actually one continuous thought that she is having within that, uh, within that song. And that's coming right straight from Sondheim himself. So that is the interpretation that we are going to go with from now on. I love it when people send me in feedback. It always lets me feel like I'm getting to understand the song on an even deeper level every single time. I love hearing other people's interpretations of of stuff. So if you have feedback on maybe even this week's episode, putting it together podcast at gmail.com. I guess we should just start the episode right now. Leave you, leave you, all leave you how could i go it alone could i wave the years away with a quick goodbye how do you wipe tears away when your eyes are dry sweetheart Jesse McAnally, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. I didn't tell you this before we started recording, but I will say you are one of the accounts that got retweeted into my timeline so often that I was like, well, I might as well just follow you because I get most of your tweets anyways. <laughs> oh, well, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, that that yeah. makes me very happy to hear. Um, I hope it's all like good things and not just like, oh, what's this nonsense? I'm going to hate following What is happening? No, I think you're very high up in like what we'll call theater Twitter circles. Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> so much so, you, of course, I think help co-host Musicals with Cheese, mm-hmm. the podcast. What uh, What's that all about? Um, So about four years ago, I think it's four years ago this year, I had the idea like, you know what? I want to force my friend Andrew to watch more musicals. And unless I make content out of my friendships, that's not a real friendship. So uh, we just decided <laughs> to turn into a podcast. Or I legitimately just try to get him to like it more every episode, sometimes with more Mm. success and sometimes with less. And now, four years later and nearly 200 episodes in, um, yeah, it's been good. We haven't missed a week yet. I'm very proud to say that since starting, we have not missed a single week of posting. 
a few questions about that. Yeah. Were there, what was the biggest surprise for you? Like the musical that, you know, either he hated or loved. It's like, oh, I was not expecting this type of reaction towards this. He had a vitriolic hatred towards the lightning thief, which is probably one of oh, our interesting. M- most like <laughs> episodes where we're obviously actually angry instead of pretending angry. And Another one that I think that I was shocked by how much he enjoyed. This isn't an episode. This is just a Patreon commentary. I forced him to watch the Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat movie. (laughs) And he still claims that is one of the best things he's ever watched. So, wow. Okay. (laughs) Huge Joseph Stan over here, apparently. Yeah. um, We'll have to cover it on the show proper. But I I don't want to ruin that joy, that that innate joy he had watching it the first time. (laughs) That's amazing. Is that so? Is that just the concert version, or is there a movie version that I'm just not There's aware of? There's a movie of? version with Donny Osmond and yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that was a concert. I think that was because I remember Richard Attenborough was in it, and he wore brown face, which always stands out to Oof. me in that movie. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially the person who makes Gandhi, you would think he would not <laughs> decide to go down that route. But uh, interesting. I, I, weirdly enough, as a as a Canadian. Mm-hmm. That is the Joseph I know the most because Donny Osmond was in the Canadian cast recording of <laughs> of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Now that that is a question I do have. Are you more f- fond of like Canadian cast recordings because they are kind of more your kind of actors and people you know? Like, do, do you like oh the Toronto cast recording is what it's all about here? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, no. Uh, if, if Gordon Pinsent is not on the cast album, then it is. I do not care for it. Is what I'm trying to say. No, there, there actually isn't that many like Canadian cast recordings specifically. Like there, there's some that float around and some that you can do. But like as far as like official recordings, unless we're talking about original musicals that started in Canada and then transferred, mm-hmm. there is not actually a lot of I found like Canadian recordings. Wasn't well, there that a get made. Phantom original cast yes. Canadian cast with Colm Wilkinson? There is a con- <laughs> Correct. Yes, okay. there there is that one. <laughs> there seems to be like an Andrew Lloyd Webber thing. There used to be a time you would probably be knowledgeable about mm-hmm. this. Of course, there used to be kind of this pipeline of like international productions starting in Toronto yeah. and then making a Broadway transfer until there's a bit of an embezzlement scandal that kind of rocked that. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, read about that on the internet, kids. But uh, yeah, for a while there there was yeah a more interest I would mm-hmm. say in Canadian cast recordings of these bigger productions that were happening. I mean, I, I think we should bring it back, like, because often I do agree they are better. I really like the Jane Eyre Toronto cast recording. Mm. Like, I, I, I'm i like in a minority of people that absolutely love that musical. So I'd like to, <laughs> I, I'm so glad that cast recording exists so I don't have to listen to a pedophile when I want to listen to Jane Eyre. Sure. That is always a better choice. If I'm given the two options. I'm going to listen to the Canadian. The, the Canadian one without yeah. the pedophile. Oh, that all being said here, of course, like what uh, what do you think was your first moment where you fell in love with theater? See, I always when I was younger, I was like, I want to be an actor. And what I meant was I want to mm. have control over people and decide stories and do that. And I thought that's what <laughs> I thought the actors got to decide right. what they said. And then I was in a lot of theater as a kid. And I then just kind of fell in love with that. Like I was dancing to Sondheim songs when I was like four or five. I think I'm still have footage of me dancing to this song in particular no 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 no, not this one not this one if only i had a four-year-old i that would be like that surreal (laughs) moment in camp when anna baby anna kendrick singing the ladies (laughs) who lunch i feel like it would give that exact vibe but no it was together wherever we go and all the those kind of songs that you could kind of pull off for children but I, I, I really fell in love with theater doing that, and I think I fell out of love for a while and then re-fell in love with it like when the Sondheim movies started coming out, at least the second generation, sure. like the Sweeney Todd's, the Into the Woods, and all that. You know, you just forced my mind to go into a spiral of thinking about what would it sound like to have a Kids Bop album Broadway edition, <laughs> and I'm sure that exists oh, it, out there somewhere. It does. The commercials were for it all the time, but I remember every time I would go to my godparents' house, they would just have that one CD, like, always on. Mm. And it they had the Jellicle Cat song, and all the kids are arguing, oh what is a Jellicle Cat? And that's just, it, it, that trails off, and I remember that specifically being the joke that no one knew what a Jellicle Cat was. <laughs> All right. Well, writing the ship here, then. So, oh, like, how dare you? Into the woods. <laughs> uh, 
I have been on record as saying on this show, I'm a bit of an apologist when it comes to the Sweeney Todd movie. Yes. I actually do think it's good. Mm -hmm. Is it the best version of Sweeney Todd? No, but it's still a good version, I find. Now, I don't know, what are your opinions on the Into the Woods? Because that is one that I actually do dislike actually quite quite a lot. I, I have varied opinions. I think the set design of that movie is incredible. Mm. I think Meryl Streep is horribly miscast, or like her performance was not in the way that I would see The Witch, and that might just be a sure. me thing. However, if we take Meryl Streep out, and James Corden didn't have the cultural impact outside of it, and then you do the wicked thing and split into two movies, we got something that works! Like, that's the only sure. musical that I could justify splitting it into two halves. It actually is, like, perfectly made to be split into two halves, in a weird way, right? It ends <laughs> It's like, oh, how is there going to be a sequel to this? Well, we're going to show you everything that bad happens mm -hmm. after this, the after the happily ever after. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, too, yeah, I understand the impact that james corden has on a lot of people it's like the word moist now or just people have some vitriol reaction to it i thought it was a good baker even though i don't like the movie that much like you can't say that he was miscast into that I role i think most of the cast in that aside from mm -hmm. meryl streep is pretty good have you dove into i'm sure you have the the unmade jim henson disney yes. version of into the woods kills me that that never was realized that is something even if it was a train wreck at least it would be an interesting train wreck i, I think i never want to share as the witch oh, yes yeah Yes. I never like to invite myself onto podcasts ever again, mm -hmm. but if you ever do the demo, the I Wish demo that Sondheim wrote for that movie, I, I would love right. to come on and just talk for sure. hours. I have that I have that one memorized start to end because it's just <laughs> you were you were dancing to that at seven. Actually, no, but one. I was amazed <laughs> that it existed. Um, but I think the entire cast of the Into the Woods uh, 2016 movie is good outside of Meryl Streep. I think they all do the work. Mm -hmm. And I think Billy Magnuson is probably the most impressive to do a lot with a little. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The princes are good in that movie, yeah. too. But, of course, we're not here to talk about Into the Woods. No. Specifically, we're here to talk about Follies. Yes. We're going back to Follies. When was your first introduction to Follies? So, it's fairly recently. Um, so, ever since I kind of knew that Sondheim wasn't going to put out another musical, like, in, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. I've been trying to pace myself to get through the rest of them. Like, even right. ones that I'm not, like, obsessed with, like, the frogs have a bit of genius in them. Um, so this was a fairly recent one that I literally just listened to and finally devoured for the podcast specifically. So I think it was just at the beginning of this year. Yeah, so it is kind of a new love for me where I get to, it feels kind of newer for me, even though everyone else in the world is like, what follies? Come on, you everyone knows about that and how brilliant it is. But I every time I'm just shocked at the way it's constructed. Like the specific stagecraft of like having the older and younger versions at different times and reflecting each other. Like that is like one of the most brilliant pieces of staging I've ever seen. It bums me out that this was like the big flop of Sondheim's like early career. Like sure. Especially like with the Hal Prince collaborations because it is so impressive like what it's trying to do and what it succeeds in doing. And I believe we brought up the fact that a movie is coming up in theory maybe question mark yeah I, I don't think that would be a very good this is just a perfect theatrical thing i can't imagine it working as a movie in any way whatsoever you know someone told me i keep going back and forth i i, I do agree i think this is very clearly a theatrical piece of fiction yes that is really made to be a theatrical experience that being said do i want to see what a movie version looks like sure i want to see that experience and see if that actually works someone gave me the idea of a way to adapt it is still have it be a period piece. Yes. But because you're now in a film universe, have it be like old Busby Berkeley musical stars and stuff like that. Like make fit, fit it more into that okay. idea of it being like film stars coming back and having one last hoorah or something like that or benefit concert or something like that. I don't know if that would work either. It's just like, you're right though. It's, I see. you're already having a hard sell on people doing like, we're talking about the Ziegfeld Follies that nobody knows about anymore. I see that working in my head quite a bit. Um, and now that I'm imagining it, I feel like we're just too precious with musicals to film adaptations lately. Mm -hmm. um, if there's one thing I'll say that I really appreciate about the Tim Burton adaptation of Sweeney Todd is how unprecious with the source material it is. Sure. Um, we will never get another movie adaptation like Cabaret. And I don't even particularly love the Cabaret film. But it mm. did its own thing, and I, I want another one of those. I agree. I, I always tell people, it's like, you can be upset that your favorite song doesn't make it yeah. into, uh, into a movie adaptation. But at the same time, yeah, movies work differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do have to make cuts or make changes that serve that medium better. And sometimes it, that just means, it's like, you know what? 
this can be much more well communicated in like a five or 10 second close up than an entire song is going to be. So let's cut that and like focus on the main important stuff. I 100% agree with that. And you're a film guy. I I, I know I you are very much in the film world in a way that I am too. So when we talk about things like this, like the structure of films and theater are just very different. Like an entire act one, it has to be a complete story. An entire act two kind There's of There's no intermission, to... so you don't get to hide behind that. So. Yeah, there, it, it just narratively, it doesn't work. And it, it goes the same way reverse. Like the Frozen musical is a mess because they do so many dramatic loop-de-loops to try to get Let It Go to be the act one closer, which narratively, yeah. it just does not support that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hollywood, hire us to fix everything. Um, No, don't hire us. Like, just pay us and we'll tell you what's wrong with it after it's done. Yeah, exactly. This is a complete aside, but it's only because I just watched this for the first time. Have you seen the film The Boyfriend, the musical The Boyfriend from 1971? I have not. Okay. Are you even familiar with the musical The Boyfriend from like 1954? Nope, but I'm looking these things up and I'm so excited to learn new things. Let's go. Here is Ken Russell made a different. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. So this is this is how bonkers this is. Just a very brief aside here. I don't necessarily think this was a great ad- adaptation either. But 1954, I forget who the lady was who wrote the music and lyrics to this show called The Boyfriend, which was supposed to be a send up of like a 1930s uh, Rogers and Hart style musical. Right. So that's what she does. It's like already a throwback in the 1950s is like the third longest running show in the West yes. End for a long time, right? Ken Russell decides to be like, oh, this is interesting. What I'm going to do to adapt this is make this huge like um, story around this of a company performing this show and all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes as they're performing the show, The Boyfriend. So it's actually not even an adaptation of the source material. It's this whole other movie. And they perform these songs and it has like Twiggy and Tommy Toon and all these people. Uh-huh. And it is bonkers crazy and has these like devolvement into like busby berkeley style musical numbers half the movie is brilliant and half the movie is like why are we why are we here what is happening in this movie but that's another way you can do it it's like let's just disregard adapting it directly and we'll like adapt it with a different adaptation around okay it. yes i agree with all that we need to go into a tangent inside this tangent do you know there's yeah. a musical stage sequel to the boyfriend called divorce me darling yeah i heard that too i was like what is that oh yeah and that's supposed to be a 1950s send-up of something else yeah it's I like cole porters and rogers and cole Hart porter and yeah um and sandy wilson was the person that did all the music lyrics yeah. and books and literally the boyfriend divorce me darling and a 1979 stage version of aladdin which wow <laughs> what a trilogy <laughs> of things but could i leave you but could i leave you is what we're really asking here today could i leave you the boyfriend divorce me darling <laughs> follies i mean yes. you said that you you're developing a love for it like how would you rate this then with other sondheim shows like where is this falling in your order Here's the problem with me ranking my song times. It's all about what I currently am kind of like obsessed with at the moment. I feel like and some days passion is my number one and some days Sweeney mm. Todd's my number one. So it's up there, but all of them are up there. Like, I think the only one that isn't up there is Evening Primrose. Although one of my favorite songs you've wrote is an Evening Primrose, interestingly enough. But OK, which one do you think is your favorite? Uh, Take Me to the World. I love that song, okay. whether it's a, a, a single or a duo. I think it works either way. Not necessarily within the the actual TV episode of Evening Primrose, which I was not the hugest fan of. Right. But other people have interpreted that song. like, Oh, this is actually very beautiful. All right. So I do have an official answer because on my show, The Dear Friends podcast, I we did a ranking of our Sondheim musicals and I have it as number five tied with Merrily as my like in my top five. Interesting. So Merrily and Follies are my number five, then Sweeney, Into the Woods, Passion and Sunday. Two shows about the ghosts of our past. Interesting. They both hit tied. the same kind of weird nostalgia button for me. Um, nothing mm-hmm. makes me quite cry the way Merrily does and nothing makes me quite look ahead. I feel... I also worry that I might be a little too young to really connect with Folly. So I'm like excited that as I get aged and older, like I'm really going to have that bricks dropped on me. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that I continue to bring up in regards to a lot of sign time stuff as like the huge fan of him that I was, there was certain like gateway shows that got me in. And then it was like, 
company. I don't really know if I get this. And then, you know, I get closer to the third. I'm like, oh, well, no, I get this. I totally understand this show. <laughs> it totally speaks to me. And I think Follies is a similar thing. Is like when I first encountered it, I was like, I don't know if I get mm-hmm. this. And then the older I get, I'm like, oh, no, I get it. I, I totally understand what it's like to like look at your past and be so upset about lost opportunities or decisions that you made that you can't change. So uh, I think you're right. I think at the older you get, like, oh, I get it. I understand. Mm-hmm. And he was always like, I feel like... <laughs> Older than what he actually was sometimes the shows that he wrote. He, I've never met a man. No, never met him. I never seen a man so confident so early, but also so mm-hmm. deeply insecure about the weirdest things. Like hearing Sondheim in interviews, he is like deeply insecure about like the way he presents characters and less about his ability as a musician. <laughs> True, true. Like, there's the famous, like, I feel pretty issue where he's like, oh, Maria's right. off the boat. She wouldn't talk like that. Come on. I'm I'm just showing off and trying to do the flowery language they wanted me to do. Yeah. Grumpy Sondheim is the best Sondheim, though, sometimes. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prep you for this, but within the show Follies, mm-hmm. what is happening like right before this song starts, like what is the lead into this song? We got Ben and Phyllis and it, things aren't going well. And Ben's basically been horrible to her and he asked for a divorce. And then she leads in because she's Phyllis has been, I won't say passive, but not as active a character up to this point. Yeah. So she's, this is her moment. This is like the moment where she gets to say everything where the lyrics are the truth and when there's nothing left for the truth it just kind of falls out and you realize how articulate and how much she's thought about this like in this song exactly yeah i think this is a great point here now to jump in Mm -hmm. and just talk about phyllis the character so like what are your opinions on phyllis see phyllis is probably i love this song but Mm -hmm. sally really gets like most of the attention in this musical for good reason yeah um but phyllis is always the one I related to more, despite all that. I agree. Uh, she's okay. uh, this is going to be like a, a a reference to Mary Tyler Moore yeah. that no one knows about anymore. But uh, she has spunk. I like the spunk that uh, Phyllis has. Yeah, but she's also emotionally abandoned and kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's a weird kind of. There's not a lot of characters like you her. mean. What I'm attracted to, Jesse, is what you're talking about. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Um, let me tell you this. I wouldn't leave her. I couldn't. <laughs> this is kind of, though, one of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing for this episode, this, the second time we're talking about this song. Yeah. You know, we have the famous losing my mind that Sally gets of her yes. mental breakdown. This isn't necessarily the, like the breakdown sequence. because Phyllis also gets her own breakdown song. But right. I think this is like the cracks starting to form of being like, oh, like this perfect image everyone is trying to do or this icy to me. It's like, oh, no. Phyllis actually cares about stuff. Yeah. And there was maybe a time that she did love Ben, but now it's like we're putting it all on the table and be like, you think you know me? You don't. You don't know who I am. Well, I got a question for you. How would you compare old Phyllis and young Phyllis? Because they feel like almost two distinctly different human beings to me. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I think, I, I guess with the bits that we are given, this is like that one trajectory that people can go where it's like, I have white eyed optimism. I am. Mm-hmm. I'm excited for the future. Um, you know, love is going to conquer all, even though there might be some red flags that are showing up in the relationship. And then after 30 years of having to put up with people's crap, you're just like, no, I'm, I'm kind of done with this. I've been, I've been turned into a basically an Elaine stretch is what's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's what's happened. I mean, that's where we all are headed. Hey, if I can, in my like, <laughs> in my like late sixties, just have like a dangling cigarette and have a raspy voice and just be like, uh, bitchy to people i'll say that's a win but is this a bomb that starts the loveland sequence in your opinion like is this like the final crack in the psyche so to say i think it is like i think that that's kind of basically my thesis here is like this is what the show wants to communicate here at least yeah is that even though there really isn't a main character necessarily i think ben is supposed to be this cipher for a lot of the show as we kind of wander through this party this is him being confronted with like oh okay, I thought this facade was was right. She puts the first crack. Love Land happens. Everyone has their kind of emotional breakdowns, and they were brought back into the show proper sort of thing. So I think that yeah. is supposed... This is all, of course, metaphorically shown on stage, but I think that is what is supposed to be communicated. Um. Yeah, okay. What do you think? I, I think all that, too, but I also have... There's a lot of things about Follies that bothers me narratively, not 
not mm. bother me as a negative. It's a bother me as in like m- my usual conception of narrative is like not falling here. Like when I see flashbacks in movies, I'm always like, is this the truth or is this just what you want me to take away from this? Sure. So, when you see all these flashbacks of all these individuals, I think the fact that they replicate the past so much and that they're not always rose colored also implies that it's the truth. But what do you think? Like, do you think it's well, all this is a, that's a hard part about follies? And I think yes. why it, you can talk about forever, which is that you're dealing with essentially four unreliable narrators. They're, right they're they're yeah. all trying to put a bit of a spin on their feelings and what mm-hmm. has happened in the past and i don't know if you can necessarily ever say like this is objectively what has happened um you can maybe get glimpses of that or be like mm, i think maybe you're overstating this which is interesting what a movie might be able to communicate maybe even more effectively which is like yeah. this is what they're saying versus actually what actually happened so that it makes it very clear as like everyone has their point of view on these events right. that have happened anyways i don't know that that's my my read on this mm. i think this is why i think it was not as embraced even in its first run yes. which is that you are you this is going to sound much more like negative than i mean it to be but if we're just looking at like the not knowledge of the audience but the sophistication of the audience mm-hmm. in 1971 versus nowadays i think we've just seen so many things in those intervening almost 50 years where we don't have to fight so hard to understand like the quote unquote narrative right. that's going on because this is not like a i'm going to take you by the hand and tell you everything that's happening you have to work at it you have to kind of fill in the blanks yourself there's side characters that just kind of swoop in and <laughs> and perform and stuff for us is like that kind of cuts into the narrative but it actually adds into like the thematic hole that we're we're talking about here too it is not uh what would have been playing at the it's not hello dolly right no, it's not it's but, not gonna it's not that straightforward of a musical but musically there is things that are dolly-esque um so mm-hmm. there's a line between the song Sondheim songs that are pastiche and the lines that are book songs. Um, Could I Leave You? It's very much a book song. It's about the characters. And then we got things, listen to the rain on the roof, go pit, patty pit. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> um, but strangely, if you think about it, um, those numbers, the the pastiche songs, are the ones in the show that people remember Perform for most, most of its life. Like mm-hmm. Broadway, Baby, um, Rain on the Roof, all those kind of things um, are very, very commonly performed. I mean, Paddington 2 will forever have rain on the roof be emblazoned on people's minds. So Exactly. And Beautiful Girls in and of itself, um, mm-hmm. just a great number, but also very pastiche. So I recently saw Bernadette Peters live and her performing in Buddy's Eyes. This is just a tangent. We don't mm-hmm. I, you brought me on. I'm gonna bring the tangent. Sure. Um, and I just wanted to say that right when she gets to the end and she's holding out before she says the last in Buddy's Eyes, someone's phone went off. <laughs> Honestly, I could oh see the anger God. in her face. It, um, 10 out of 10. She didn't 10. go full Patty Lapone on them, unfortunately. No, but, no, yeah. no. Bernadette <laughs> Peters has class. She was in <laughs> Ohio. She wasn't going to fight no one in Ohio. It kills me. I had tickets to see Bernadette Peters years ago, and she yeah. had to cancel like the week before. So I never got to see her. I'm so sorry. I have I had had this quick trip planned I took to a cabin to spend with friends this past mm-hmm. weekend, and I get an email four days before I'm supposed to leave, like, hey, did you know Bernadette Peters is coming? Like, no, I didn't know she was coming. Why didn't no one tell me she was coming to my city? The day I was leaving, I'm like, you are killing me <laughs> that she is here in my city and I can't and I can't go and see her because I have non-refundable tickets oh <laughs> to go to this thing. That just broke my uh, heart for you. Um, I'm going to lose one more time that she comes so I can see her in person. She still got it. She can still roll around on that piano like she's 21 and it still works. <laughs> Oh, um, I love it. Okay. I, I'd like to see Elaine Stritch pull that off right now today. <laughs> I don't think she can uh, do it. <laughs> you told me about this uh, performance that Ariana DeBose did. Oh, I, yes, I think I it's did. at 54 Below. Yes, it looks like 54 Below. Oscar winner Ariana DeBose well before when she was yes. still ensemble member Ariana DeBose. I know it's like person who is in uh, Hamilton for 30 seconds that you can see on Disney Plus. I was going to say it's almost too bad. Like she's been having quite a year Oscar yes. winner now. Schmigadoon. Oh, she just cast in. Oh, yeah. In Schmigadoon. She's in Craven the Hunter. Oh, yeah. Got hired into like a Marvel film here recently. She will have hosted the Tonys by the time this episode comes hosted out. Hosted like a month ago. Hosted SNL. Yeah. So she's she's definitely having a big moment here this year. Good. Great. I think she's a, a f- phenomenal performer. So she'll get that EGOT before before, before the, the day is out. Thank goodness.
Hey everyone, just Kyle breaking into the conversation here to tell you about some of the people and organizations that help this show continue to go. If you'd like to help support the show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in. It's greatly appreciated, of course. And if you'd like to help monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I also need to give a huge thank you to the God That's Good tier from Patreon. So thank you to Jack, Todd, Carrie, Louise, Christopher, and Stephen. Putting Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This episode of Putting It Together is brought to you by the Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross Group Benefits Plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head on over to ab.bluecross.ca. This episode is also brought to you by Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider in Alberta, offering internet, electricity, and natural gas with low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you do get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you choose Park Power, you are choosing a positive local business. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local not-for-profits and are working to make a difference for their communities. Shopping local is very important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski, and we love local here at the Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more at parkpower.ca. I have uh, broken this out into different bits here. So let's listen to the opening bit of Could I Leave You as Sung by Ariana DeBose. Okay, let's just talk about the, like, there's repetition, but every single one of these rhymes kind of creeps up on you. Like, Mm -hmm. you listen to a song, even some sometimes best, you kind of know where it's going to go. It's like, like, you know, above, you're going to get to love somehow. Um, Sure. But let's think about, like, sweetheart lover, how could I recover? Like, that alone just kind of feels like a change. Pills again and dinners for ten elderly men from the UN. From the UN. Yeah, it's just showing off at that point. Yes. And then we swing right back alone to every day at five with how could I survive? Yeah, I think that there's some beautiful uh, kind of rhyme schemes that are going through this this song. I mean, obviously, yes, you can. For for some of those, I think it's obvious. Oh, we're going on like a, a chain of rhymes here. Mm-hmm. But the thing that always impresses me a lot about Sondheim is, and we'll see this especially later on. Yes is how much it feels like it's just someone giving a monologue without it necessarily calling attention to itself that it's rhyming, which is a very hard thing to do, I find. It's really hard to, like, make it be a rhyming song and not super call attention to itself. Well, the way you do that, and Sondheim is the king of this, is he doesn't do the backward talk. Um, Like, you see a lot of, like, especially those big mega musicals of the time, where they'd be like talking backwards so that the rhyme would happen in a way that no one else would do it. Mm-hmm. And Sondheim is like, nope, it must feel natural coming out of your mouth. It must feel the way that human beings talk. Um, and even when you get like the wacky lyrics, like while her withers wither with her, mm-hmm. that is still grammatically correct. It, you're not going right. to flip around sentence structure and talk like Yoda just to fit that rhyme at the end of the phrase. Yeah, which is something that even like uh, a Noel Coward or uh, a Cole Porter and stuff like mm-hmm. that would sometimes do. They would force a rhyme 
or make him talk yeah, like you said in a backwards way just to make the rhyme happen mm-hmm. those are some lovely songs you get but it's like yeah like that's not i can tell that you're making that rhyme you can hear the songwriter in that yeah and it's on time to his credit and to his fault which i think when people say oh you can't hum it it's because you don't see the author's hand quite as blatantly here mm-hmm. and the reason why you can't hum it is you don't have anything that's going to stick into your ears like what what was that line <laughs> <laughs> which in one hand brings quotability to it like what's the line from um avita i always do? it's a pretty bad state for a state to be in right, like that that right. sounds like a clever line but if you actually break it down it's kind of dumb right like it's not really communicating anything right mm-hmm. yeah i i think as far as the actual content goes yes. here it is one of the this this great i mean i know sondheim often talked about like how he was not a dramatist but it's yeah. it's amazing how he can sometimes just fill in this world of a character through the lyrics and be like oh no i totally get what this relationship must be like at least from phyllis's point of view where it's like can i leave you you mean like give up all these boring parties i have mm-hmm. to go to and these uh dreadful people i have to make appearances with and give you your pills and like watch you blather away it's like okay yeah no i get it <laughs> like you are fed up right now there's that old quote for him that i i know best from like the 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 sick or the sondheim on sondheim album where he's like if you ask me to write a love song i don't know what to do mm-hmm. but if you tell me this girl orders a grasshopper at a bar after just being dumped i have the bar to work with i have the drink to work with i have all <laughs> these things and i think yeah, this yeah. song shows that to most he's like I can't just write a breakup song. I need to know what she's been through. What is going on? I need to know all these things. So he can paint this picture of what her relationship looks like. So without him being like describing his life or either of them doing it, it's her yelling at him about what she's been through. Yes. Yeah, I agree. It paints a beautiful picture. Like this is such great, like storytelling character development and one strangely catchy song i know people like i like i don't really <laughs> love his book songs but my god to that point here is how uh she continues on here so Could I- She's just beginning here. So never has anyone said passionless lovemaking once a year with quite so much venom, I don't think. Uh, yeah, Ariane DeBose brings a lot of a lot more anger to this instead of the heartbreak. A lot of folks bring the heartbreak. I think Diana Rigg really does a great mm. job at bringing the heartbreak. Ariane DeBose is vicious and beautifully vicious in this. I wish I, Revival. Come on. We, we know who our Phyllis is here. I would love to see a huge, big production of, of Follies here one last time. Yes. Uh, or one more time, I should Come say. Come on. I mean, we're re- reviving forbidden... all the other Sondheim stuff here recently, so why not? But then it's the forbidden Broadway sketch of like, we're doing Follies. We got to right this time. <laughs> I promise. We swear. <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. It's, but this time, it's going to work. It's like any time. <laughs> and I, I've, I've heard the good things from London about uh, anyone can whistle and everything. But that's what it always is. But this time, it's going to work. I'm like, it's not. But st- sure, let's let's watch it. The only time I ever believed it was Nathan Lane and the Frogs. Like, this time, we're going to make it work. Come on, Stephen. <laughs> okay. This time, real frogs. Okay? <laughs> real frogs. We're not going to do it in a swimming pool this time, all right? <laughs> Once again, just the lyrics. Like, always, a, like, one of the things that I love and you, things about Sondheim you don't realize you love until you're looking at the lyrics is how often, even the rhymes, they are not spelled the same way. Like, what is it? Martyred looks, cryptic sighs, song glares from the injured eyes. Um, Sighs, mm-hmm. eyes, it's different ways of spelling and getting to the rhyme um mm-hmm. i feel like most sneer and year yeah. yeah they don't do the double e or the all that um the same way and i see a lot of composers like eyes dies just put a d there <laughs> like right 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 e- even very good composers do that stuff where i'm like uh, uh, stretch yourself a bit uh yeah there was a i think you just brought it up here a moment ago but i remember listening to this talk from a 
a, a songwriter once it was like it's it's unfortunate that it's like as soon as you hear anything that ends in of it's like well yeah. they're gonna say love here later on in the song so it's like you're almost calling attention to yourself it's you have to think of different ways to communicate this without being so obvious the thing that i actually noticed this time we looking mm-hmm. at this song is that even though she is like just like kind of starting it up to be very pissed off by the end of this song, there is this interesting portion within here that I think there is still a bit of a love for Ben that mm-hmm. is kind of creeping through because she even calls it out. It's like, I can't keep up with the, yes, those cryptic sighs, but sullen glares from those injured eyes. It's yes. not, you know, cold calculated eyes or those menacing eyes. No, it's injured. He, she's admitting to the fact that he himself is is an injured person or or a sad person and i think like that paints it she's not victimizing herself either which is another interesting mm-hmm. thing like i it would have been so easy to be like your terrible horrible husband when this is much more real much darker much more like we there's nothing there between us now it's a, a much more honest portrayal of people who are together in their marriage for convenience at this point Right, right, right. Do you know about the world's best books by any chance? No. Tell me about the world's best books. <laughs> well, this is me trying to remember this from memory here now, but it always made, when I was reading these lyrics the first time, like right. uh, whatever that was, a couple of years ago, it's interesting because it's capitalized. World's yes. best books. And it's like, well, that can't be a mistake. <laughs> but it was a series. It's kind of like, I don't know, like Reader's Digest classics or something like that it's books that were made you look smarter than you really were but you probably have never read them in your entire life yes, okay that, that makes Which sense is, again okay. a, nice, a nice little dig to uh <laughs> to him i'd be very interested to like throw a first rhyme at this like because every yeah. there's no like internal rhymes here there's all they're all at the end i want to throw someone like all right rhyme ill concealed with something and give me a making sentence like give them leave the lies ill concealed figure out what it's gonna go where, where do you think they would rhyme do you think wounds never healed would come right away not not right away no you'd have to go through a few i think it would be like um people would definitely jump to congealed somehow <laughs> <laughs> my feelings staying congealed or something like that yeah it's like when people like get to sore and they're like um what do i rhyme down to my core <laughs> I swear, if I ever have to hear down to my core in a musical ever again, I, I, I'm... Or it's like, it's like people seem to be like contractually obligated to, to rhyme life with strife. It's like, can we think of another thing that we can rhyme those two words with? Like a knife is not that hard a line to get to, guys. <laughs> we'll continue doing our workshop here in a moment. Uh, this is a bit of a longer section as she uh, gets, goes back into saying, what, leave you, leave you. Oh, yes. But she, like, yells, which I love. This, this has my favorite rhyme in the show. What? Leave you, leave you. How could I leave you? What would I do on my own? Putting thoughts of you aside in the south of France. What I think of suicide. Dog, shall we dance? Could I live through the pain on a terrace in Spain? Would it pass? It would pass. Could I bury my rage with a boy your age in the grass? Bet your ass. But I've done that already. Or didn't you know, love? Tell me how could I leave when I left long ago? Love. Oh, uh, thoughts of you aside, and then think of suicide. Yes. That's fantastic, great rhyme. right? It's one of those rhymes that sneaks up on you. It, uh, this song is like the best of like, all right, how are we going to get to the end of it? Because we set up the rhyming convention so quickly. So as soon as you get to something like, how, how are we getting there? Putting thoughts yeah, yeah, of yeah. you aside. And sometimes um, an actor can kind of hedge a rhyme to make it sound like more like the word. But if you just say it naturally and then you get there, like, my gosh, that, that is like peak dopamine rush of pl- pleasure. Like, like, yes, yes. Thank you. Galaxy brain explosion type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I've seen some a- performers go like, putting thoughts of you aside where they really mm-hmm. get that. So they the second one hit. Um, what I love about this one here, too, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's obvious that Ben has been sleeping around with, yes. with other women inside their marriage. But I like her admissions like, hey, you don't think I've been doing the same Ye- thing? You right. don't think I can pull people? Look at me. I'm Phyllis. Look how hot I am. And it's just a throw. Which in is like, why I just have to say why I think 
I love Bernadette Peters to death. Why she should have been Phyllis and not Sally in the show. I agree. I, 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 but how else are you going to get Bernadette to sing Lose in My Mind? We, we got to get know. there. But the bet your ass, Ariana DeBose <laughs> of it all, like the choices there is incredible. I want to go through the pain in a terrace in Spain so it would pass. Like that sounds like an ideal situation. But the thing is, a lot of characters a lot of easy ways of a put upon wife character in a movie or a musical would be like oh he's cheating on me and i just sit at home she's like no i did my thing like come on <laughs> like that's not the problem here we know what's going on. We're, we're all adults here right yeah yeah avoiding very easy easy cliches here of, of course i think the the biggest dig here too is like there is the the i guess in any type of breakup there's the two times you leave someone when you've yeah. emotionally left them and we physically left them. And she's admitting like, Hey, I checked out of this relationship years ago. Yeah. Like, I have already left. You're I just nothing physically special. left you. Other people are meeting my needs the, the way that I want them to be met sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you provide money basically, I think is what the subtext is here. Yeah. So uh, and which, which she gets to here in a minute, in a minute. It's just so mean to show a guy or anyone that, you mean nothing to me aside from what you financially benefit to me. Sure. Sure. This is how, of course, we uh, continue on here. Yes. So. Oh, could I leave you? No, the point is, could you leave me? Well, I guess you could leave me the house, leave me the flat, leave me the rocks and chagalls and all that. You could leave me the stocks for sentiment's sake. Yeah, she is losing her mind here at this point, not to uh, be punny here about the show that we're talking about, but she is screaming Oh yeah, <laughs> at, at the end of this. Emotionally, she is just drained. Like, she's just... Mm -hmm. it, I mean, this is where it becomes less of a song and more of a rant. This is where mm -hmm. the official patented Sondheim breakdown song happens. <laughs> where sure, sure. It becomes closer to Epiphany or Rose's turn than it does to, uh, like, stay with me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is like that, that great a uh, actor piece too, right? Like you can really act into this song, which I think the best musical theater does. You, you know, you hope you have a great singer who can actually act, but I, I think it just goes a good way if you have a, have a great actor there too, who can really sell this moment and be like, oh, she is upset by this. She's like, sure, you, you're telling me that you're going to like get a divorce or whatever thing, but like kind of screw you. I, I, I can be out here like today if you really want to, but I know that you need me more than I need you. Yeah. Have you not to go on a tangent, but have you looked at like Chagall's and Brock's? I did. I think I, I did originally and just to take a look at what they looked like, but is there anything specific? No, it's just, I'm trying to imagine what their house looks like now. Oh, gotcha. Very austere, very rich. Yeah, very, very, but they're kind of like, they, <laughs> No, big respect, but they kind of look a little infantile a little bit. Sure. Like mm -hmm. the faces, especially kind of, I don't know. It feels very distinct, especially the, the, the Chagall's. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know enough about art to, to make any specific opinion, but I think I seem to recall something like that, which is again, if you want to be mean about it, like the, the, those are the types of paintings people buy that don't know a lot about art and want to seem sophisticated rather than like, other things you could potentially buy. Like, it looks like Chagall's big on like the 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 loop arm as opposed to like the bendy mm. arm, where it's like you're sure. just gonna draw you, and that is your bent arm. Uh, look up Chagall's kids; they're pretty interesting. Yeah. What's the best thing to do is to talk about visual art in an audio medium. I mean, <laughs> I mean, describing it and then being like, you know what? He did a good job with the describing that vocally, like ten out of ten. That's right. That's right. Great, the loopy arm. Love the loopy arm. My favorite rhyme is probably from this, which is going like, you keep the spinet and then yes. wait a goddamn minute. I love that when it comes well, uh, unless full you're, circle. Unless you're Kathy Lee, then it's wait a fucking minute. That's right. So you, I think, have a story about that. Like, what, what made her decide to change that lyric? Because was Sondheim alerted about that? Did he know she was going to yes. change it? Yes. Kathy Lee is a devout Christian and did not want to say the Lord's name in vain. 
and right. she brought this up to Sondheim, and he was, I think she was like a replacement for the right. revival, and he was like, well, let's do this alternative. She's like, that works. So she no longer says the Lord's name in vain, but she definitely says, wait a fucking minute. Yeah, I've seen the videos of that, and like, <laughs> I, th- I think it's weird, too. I am of a certain age where I mm-hmm. still remember Regis and Kathy Lee in the mornings. Yeah. So to hear her like drop an F-bomb is like, whoa, oh, I was not expecting Kathy Lee to do that. She did a good job, too. Like, a surprisingly mm-hmm. good job, because like, it was Kathy Lee, and then he was, she was replaced with Kelly Ripa. So all the Regis co-hosts actually had a, t- a turn to be in the show. Okay, what did Kelly play Phyllis before? Oh, sorry. I thought that's what you meant. That's no, honestly no, no. what I thought you meant. Okay. No, no. She, you were saying that she was replaced on the on, yeah, on Regis yeah, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're correct. I know, but now I want to see the Regis cinematic universe of Sondheim. Yeah, now Kelly Ripa does need to be in a musical. Yeah. Have you? Okay, not for nothing. Have you seen the video of Regis dressing up as Shrek from Shrek the Musical? I have, yeah. <laughs> Which is weird because he, under makeup, does kind of look like Brian Darcy James in a weird way. So it's like... Doesn't quite have the eyebrows to fill it. No, that, that that should have been the replacement Shrek was Regis Philbin. <laughs> I, I can't I can't even do an imp- I guess I'd be a hero with sword and armor clashing. I can't do voices. The thing with Regis is that you have to like start like slow and then get really fast. It's like I went to a barber shop the other day. I and mean, like that's how he that's how he was. I talk. went to a barber <laughs> shop the other day because yeah, he's very just, big when he gets to the end. I know he, gets, he starts off and he gets really big by the end of the. So, yeah, I, I just want to say, like, I'm so glad that you called out this Ariana DeBose performance because it's really, right. I love this portion of it specifically because she just goes for it. Now, would this yeah. be sustainable eight shows a week? That I don't know. But for a one off performance, I think it works really, really well. Well, I this this role specifically is um, a little different than other ones in especially on Broadway. They're off stage for like many songs at a time. And it's hard like from what I hear from most actresses playing it, it's hard to stay into that and remember where you are emotionally due to that. Oh, um, sure. There's this great interview with Jan Maxwell about it where she's like describing the song and talking about all of her connections with it. And she's like uh, for like 20, 30 minutes at a time, I'm just off stage and then i have to come back and still be in the heated argument i started uh, 20 minutes ago and try to remember where that was sure. so i, no, I, I think this it. is fairly sustainable um i mean if anyone can do it ariana debose i think that woman is a human muscle <laughs> you've seen her at the skivvies performance right i don't know if i have actually what did she do um either way she just wore something in nice and i was like oh my god that woman is just all muscle she is like oh i see what you're saying gotcha yeah, a- yeah, yeah. extremely strong as a human being she can mm-hmm. bench me if she wanted oh she could break me in half yes <laughs> very easily <laughs> <laughs> uh here's how our song ends here though leave you leave you The time that they used the lyric prediction prediction against you, like we set it up with uh, confess, yes, and then what's she gonna say? Yes, ah, <laughs> yes, yeah. That's that's what I mean. Like that. That I think the beauty of this song specifically is that I think it almost tricks you into thinking, oh, I know exactly what she's going to say yes. at the end, and then he doesn't say it. And also another bit of a interesting twisting of the knife because it's like, who is the real? Yeah. idiot in this relationship it's me because i'm gonna stick around when i should have actually left you a long time ago right and just the fact that it has a punchline i love when songs have a little punchline <laughs> <laughs> like they they build up and build up and you get a release at the end yeah and it's so yeah. many different interpretations of the way people give guests like i love ariana's interpretation i love like so many different sh- types of ways to go about it um have you ever heard sondheim's demo of this I'm sure I actually have at some point, but was there something specific? Um, just the fact that he puts no emotion into it, and he's usually like all right. emotion, but here he's like, could I leave you? No, the point is, could you leave me? Uh, he, the way he does. <laughs> like, because he starts yeah, right, very right, right. big on each line. Could I leave you? <laughs> 
<laughs> he's, the, he's the reverse Regis Philbin, is what you're saying. Yes, he starts big and then he trails <laughs> off. Darling, you keep the drugs, Angel, you keep the books, honey, I'll take the bread, sugar, you keep the spinner, and all of our friends in just wait a goddamn minute, but leave you, leave you, how good I leave you, sweetheart, I have to confess, could I leave you, yes, will I leave you, will I leave you? Just to reiterate what something I had said before, like why great performance can bring so much to this is because every line is dripping with how do you want to approach this character? Yes. Is this like in the, in this case with Ariana DeBeau, she is like very darted, like yeah. th- throwing barbs at you. But you can approach this other ways and be like very wounded and like trying to reveal yourself until and you break at that wait a goddamn minute line. I think that's closer to Jan Maxwell's performance, which is very mm-hmm. much broken, um, a l- less positive and less like. This is a breakdown in the emotional sense. Donna Murphy, when she goes about it, it is she's in a trance, especially in that red dress performance that for that uh, Sondheim yeah, yeah. concert. <laughs> Fantastic job there. Ariane DeBose, when she says, could I leave you? I should just say, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. I just want to say, when I die and if there is a heaven... Those are the five ladies I want to be <laughs> greeting me as I get to the pearly gates are those five women in dresses. Yeah, uh, well, don't forget Elaine and her, like, little yeah. red... You're still here! Yeah. You're still here? Yeah. <laughs> but the little smile she says when she says, could I leave you? Yes! And then it goes into, like, this dead, like, crunched up glare, like, could mm-hmm. I... Will I leave you? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's brilliant. A, it's that whole, like, uh semantic thing that teachers love to do it's like oh could you you mean will you there is a difference when you ask those two questions well i think that's when phyllis gets her footing back back from like Mm -hmm. the way to goddamn minute is right when she has that pause of could i leave you yes and then she's like i know exactly what i'm gonna say and then yeah that last guess can be like uh, a slam the door moment or it can be like an introspective like all your knees yeah i'm so i'm I'm so depressed that that is the real answer to this. So there it is. That's could I leave you? I mean, Mm -hmm. um, for you, do you think if you look at the entire score of Follies? Yes. Would you say that this is like in your top three, middle three, bottom three? Like where would it rate for you in the score? I'd say top one or two. (laughs) Come on. Mm hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and this is this is like one of my favorite Sondheim songs I've ever written. Um, I don't revisit Follies a ton, but I revisit this song so much. I th- like it, anytime I'm like bored, I just have a playlist of like different variations of this. I'm like everyone, everyone is a knockout. Anyone, even people that can't sing perfectly, even just students when they sing this song, there's just so much to work with narratively. Sure, it's so surprising too of like how close there it was to having yeah. no. Folly's album recorded from the original cast, at least, oh which would have been kind of a bit of a travesty, I think, in many, I in many ways. So I'm glad it existed and that, glad that there was that 85, I think, mm-hmm. concert or yeah, the Mandy one night one. only. That's right. Where he goes absolutely bonkers on stage. Yes. Because, <laughs> <laughs> of course, he does. Um, he's Mandy Patinkin. Mm-hmm. Um, what about you? Where does this rank in your Follies rankings? I think I'm right there actually with you in this case. It's probably top three for me. I'm trying to very quickly flip through. I, I weirdly enough, the 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 one song in the score that I know I rate way higher than most people is the Loveland sequence. I love the Loveland sequence. It's great. So I usually rate that way higher than most people. But the, it, it's this, and there is um, I'm, uh, like I'm still here. Of course, is is in this mm-hmm. score. I love Beautiful Girls. The way that the whole show starts. Like there's a lot of good bangers inside of the show. There's very few that I would say like are bad. No. Uh, or I would rate bad. The only ones that would be in like the bottom three are like those. Yeah, like more inc- inconsequential ones like the uh i shouldn't say inconsequential just ones yeah. i don't revisit a lot like the uh the old like operetta operetta performance which uh, i've gotten a little bit more love for the more i've listened to different versions but it's like still not my favorite thing to listen to you know what i think my, like the only one that gives this one a little bit of competition for me is waiting for the girls upstairs that is such a brilliant mm. theatrical tool and great storytelling yeah. tool like every time i'm at perfect musical theater moment yeah yeah i it, every, even in shows i don't love by sondheim there is one moment that just drops my jaw to the floor that i'm like how did you do that um like yeah. Pacific overtures I, that show has a lot of fans um i understand mm. it uh, but it doesn't strike with me but someone in a tree almost Someone's makes me great. cry every time i listen to it 
Yeah, that's perfect. Well, Jesse, if people wanted to see more of what you're up to, oh. uh, how can they do so easily online? Well, if you just type in Jesse McNally in Google, um, a nice picture will, be, will pop up and like you'll get my website, you'll get our BPN. Uh, but make sure you spell it correctly. It's spelled McAnally, um, just so you know. Um, I, I know what it looks like. It's McAnally. Um, also, you of can the, find of me... the West Coast McAnally's, or is that <laughs> a different... I'm and my co-host on musicals with cheese um andrew he was always like it sounds like a dj name mc anal oh my God. um but find me on musicals with they're cheese. very particular on their setups yeah hell yeah um and the dear friends podcast both on the broadway podcast network i'm also on once more with dragons there with um musical theater mash tommy from that emily clark and yes yeah yeah, yeah they're all very good human beings um dear friends i also do with emily clark and um Christy Esterly, um, or the diva from Musical Hell, if we're going to use our pretend names. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's perfect. Yeah. It's so you, much fun. Uh, last, last question that uh, I should ask here, which I just realized I forgot to ask my other guests I'm doing in this special mini season. <laughs> but regardless, um, is there a Sondheim show that you have not seen a live production of that you hope you can at some point? Huh. I want to see anyone could whistle like properly. Mm -hmm. I want to sit down and watch that. And passionate at the moment is like one of my favorite Sondheim musicals. It's probably one or two. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see a proper production of that. I, l I think that is the most beautiful pro shot ever done is the Donna Murphy one shot on proper right. 35 mil film. Beautiful right. looking movie. But I'd love to see that live. Um, those two. And maybe one day someone will get bounced to or road show to work. <laughs> I'd like this to see time, that. We're going to make it work. Real <laughs> oh, frogs. Or what is it? What is the square one? Like the one that he's doing Union square or whatever it's called. The, yeah. I can't the remember. one that will never come out one, now. I, think. I know. I feel so bad about that, but I, th I, here's my bold proclamation. There's going to be a concert version of that at some point. They're going to get together a bunch of big stars. They only stars. finish the first act. Yeah, They'll do the first act. They'll sing the first act and they'll do a charity benefit thing. I would actually be interested if they just finish the second act with like Sondheim proteges that are actively working. You get the Adam Gittels, you get the Jason Robert Browns, you get the Lynn Manuel mm -hmm. Miranda's in there. They each do a song, and then we just kind of round out what they were gonna do, like with with his legacy. Like, yeah, I think I do think that's probably the best way to do it. It's like, hey, first act original <laughs> Sondheim material, and yeah. then second half is a different thing. Have you read the putting it together? I know, I, I know, I know. James Lapine stole the title of your podcast there um, with his book. <laughs> I kind of stole that it from book, them, though? but yes, uh, it is on my shelf, ready to read. I have not made the time to read it yet it baffles uh, if you listen to the audiobook great great read there len cario is a great sondheim oh. impersonation impersonation there um the thing is he is a chronic procrastinator and literally yes. would not get anything done if james pine was like all right we're staging this in two weeks let's go that youthful energy so he needed someone young to work with him to get that thing done someone bright yeah, just move this along yeah i mean imagine if you walk into sondheim's house and he's like you want to join come on let's smoke weed and look at some stuff i would have smoked weed with sondheim in a new york <laughs> minute <laughs> uh, all right thanks jesse thank you so much Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network, to Alberta Blue Cross, and to Park Power this week. Putting It Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere that you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, if Mama was married, we're going way back in time into the Sondheim canon, and I'm gladly going to give it away. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now.
What's, What's a jellicle cat? cat? I have no idea. Don't ask me. I don't know. You just sang a whole song about it. How could you it not know? It must be some huh? kind of cat. I mean, huh? if you ask me, maybe.